cells over a number of years, and there is no doubt from all of these, it is a specific inflammation. These T cells, they go into, into the muscle because they want to cause damage at that very location. And <clears throat> what we found was that even more so, the muscle fibers themselves can add to this. The muscle fibers can express certain molecules on the surface that lead to an inflammatory signaling and activation of T cells, which means that the T cells become more aggressive and become licensed to kill, if you would like to call it like that. In addition to the T cells, which we normally need, for example, to kill cells that are infected by a virus, there are B cells. And the function of B cells is that they produce proteins that we call antibodies. And these antibodies are also required to target and to eliminate, for example, bacteria. <clears throat> now, in IBM, it has been shown that similar to the T cells, that in the muscle we have B cells that have clonally expanded, that, don't, that just don't happen to be in the muscle. They have been recruited very, very specifically. And what has been shown a couple of years ago is that there is a specific antibody that is called CN1A antibody. And it has been identified by two groups in the Europe and the US at the same time. And they published back to back in a prestigious journal. And they showed that about a third of the patients with IBM carry this antibody. It depends on the sensitivity and the threshold of the test that you use to detect these antibodies. If you use a very low threshold, then you will have unspecific findings as well, but it could be that up to 60% are positive. Important is that this antibody really seems to make a damage because the patients that are positive have a more severe disease cause compared to those that do not carry this antibody. So all of the evidence that we have is that it is a specific immune response, however, it is important to point out that it is not exclusive for IBM. So we do see this antibody in patients that don't even have a muscle disease. But this is something that we also see in other conditions and with other antibodies as well. Now, second, the degenerative mechanisms. Clearly, several years ago, it has been shown in muscle cell systems that if you induce the degenerative response in the muscle, that the muscle develops the same protein accumulations that we see on muscle histology cross-sections. And the same thing happens if we, do, if we induce it by the precursor form of amyloid, or if we use the amyloid, the end product itself. So the cells will accumulate proteins, they will form vacuoles, and they will die. They will not develop inflammation. Secondly, and I'm only showing one of, I think, at least five, maybe eight different IBM models that all have been generated by different groups with slightly different features. And the end result is always the same. There is a myopathy. There is a degeneration. There is a damage of the muscle cells. And there is an accumulation of these proteins. And there is a weakness of the mice, but there is no inflammation. This is another model with TDP43, this is one of the molecules that we see in the skeletal muscle. And again, we have damage 
signaling in the skeletal muscle of mice and in the cell culture, the cells die. And <clears throat> we see that the fibers that are positive and they show degeneration, they also um, have signs of endoplasmatic reticulum cell stress. What about the direct crosstalk between inflammation and degeneration? A few years ago, it has been shown that in the muscle fibers that are positive for amyloid, one of the degenerative molecules, that they are positive here in red, and that in the same myofibers, we have signals of cell stress, MHC1, as one mediator of cell stress and inflammation. And now, if we used a cell culture model with plain, naive, normal, healthy muscle fibers, only by exposing them to pro-inflammatory cytokines led to a cell stress response and ultimately the expression of degenerative molecules like APP and an accumulation of amyloid and the cells ultimately died. As we said in the beginning, there are various cell stress cascades, like nitric oxide, and this has been shown to be present in muscle samples from patients with IBM. And in this same cell culture model, if you induce the cell stress and you expose the muscle cells to pro-inflammatory cytokines, on the way to accumulate proteins like amyloid, on this way, they develop and produce nitric oxide that you can detect inside the skeletal muscle, inside the muscle cells. This model has touched upon by Dr. Nagaraju this morning, and it is extremely important, an important piece of the literature. It has been published um, 19 years ago in uh, 2000, and it originally was meant to be a model for polymyositis. What the group around Paul Plotz and uh, Dr. Nagaraju did, they transformed mice to overexpress this MHC1 molecule. And they had a system where they could control it by a drug that could, give, could be given to the mice. They could feed them with the drug and take them off the drug and depending on if the mice got the drug or not, they would express MHC1 on the surface of the muscle fibers. Now, the idea was to create an inflammation similar to polymyositis to induce this MHC1 and to induce an inflammation and then to take off the drug and that the inflammation should go away. Now, they were able to induce the inflammation. They turned on the MHC1 expression. They turned it off again, but the inflammation continued. And this is extremely important to know because this is something what we think happens in IBM. There seems to be a vicious cycle that can kick in if there's too much signaling, too much inflammation, too much cell stress. It'll go on automatically, and this is what has been elegantly shown by Dr. Nagar Raju already a couple of years ago. And something similar is present in <clears throat> IBM muscle fibers, and one of the indicators is a heat shock protein called alpha B crystalline. This has been shown um, in 2000, in the same year that um, the mouse study was published by Dr. Nagaraju, um, by Dr. Engel's lab, and he showed that there are X fibers. X fibers means that these fibers were appearing normal. They didn't have protein accumulations, they didn't have inflammatory cells around them. They appeared normal, but 
alpha B crystalline, this heat shock protein, was already present as an indicator that something was wrong inside these muscle fibers. And we could confirm this and extend it and could show that in the cell culture system that we had established, the same thing happened on the way to accumulation of beta amyloid. The cells expressed various cell stress molecules, including alpha-B crystalline, one of the heat shock proteins. And we will hear why this is so important in IBM in terms of new treatment avenues. Now, re recent research. These are <clears throat> some of the meaningful studies that have been published in the last years in terms of underlying conditions that could predispose the muscle fibers to react in the way that I just described. There are certain genetic factors, like HLA molecules. These are surface molecules that are important for the immune system to distinguish between self and non-self elements. And these have been shown to be associated with inclusion body myositis. There is one molecule that is associated with autophagic processing that is, has been mentioned also earlier today. The machinery of recycling of molecules inside the skeletal muscle. And this has been shown to be associated with IBM as well. One factor that seems to be at least slightly protective is a polymorphism that means some kind of genetic alteration in the mitochondrial gene. And <clears throat> this is named here Tom Forty. And those patients that had this abnormality or this variation, otherwise they were healthy, um, seemed to have a milder disease cause of, the, of IBM. <clears throat> this is something I <clears throat> brought with me just to reiterate what we already knew. Um, and this is one of the two studies that have been published lately. So the cytotoxic T cells and the signature of them and how they are activated in the muscle is a continuing important element of research in IBM. And all of the studies, again, show that there is a specific immune function going on in inclusion body myositis. Another way of looking at interactions between cell stress elements and the degeneration has been um, published in this year, so very recently, and it could show in muscle samples from patients with IBM that if there is an accumulation in the muscle that is positive for TDP43, that we do see a damage signal of mitochondria, meaning that those cells that acquire protein accumulation, that they have a problem of energy supply and that the mitochondria do not work as sufficiently as you would need them to be. Another study that has been published last year um, looked at another um, cell stress cascade, the endoplasmic reticulum cell stress, which is um, a cascade <clears throat> um, within the um, recycling um, machinery of the cell and which is, has been shown to be in conjunction with aggregates that are positive for myostatin. Now, lastly, um, a, a study from this year from the Greenberg um, lab um, showed again that T cells are um, present in IBM and that they clonally expand. And the new finding was that there's <clears throat> a, a molecule, a surface molecule, and a certain subset of these um, T cells which are um, found to be very, very specific. And this is KLRG1, <clears throat> according to this um, publication, a signature of very late and very um, aggressive T cells that can attack the muscle readily. 
So this is all very complex and difficult to digest. Now, treatment is a little bit easier to grasp, but it's a sad story because so far, as you all know, there is no effective treatment in IBM. So this is the list of all of the studies that have been carried out in IBM, and they were all more or less negative. At least the primary outcome was never met by these clinical studies, apart from maybe some features that were discussed earlier today, for example, concerning the swallowing function in one of these IVIG trials. However, that was not the primary outcome, and therefore these studies are considered to be negative. However, one of these studies, for example, we looked at the samples, and we looked in samples from patients that received a T-cell blocking agent. That was the CAMPATH study that was on the um, end of the previous slide. A CAMPATH study means that the patients, all of them, 13, received the drug in an open-label fashion. That means there was no um, placebo control. And the patients and the, um, knew that they got the, um, the, the drug. And there were biopsy samples before and after the treatment. And what was clearly seen, all of the T cells were completely eradicated. And due to this, the inflammation in the muscle was diminished. And three years ago, we looked at these same samples and did PCR studies, and we could confirm, yes, the inflammatory markers, they went down. However, the degenerative markers and the cell stress markers persisted. So this is something along the lines with what Dr. Nagaraju found is in his mice. He stopped this gene for this inflammation, but the inflammation smoldered on. So here, the patients, they felt better, but only for some time but they did not completely recover from IBM, and overall, the progression could not be stopped. We looked at IBM patients that received IVIG over a number of years, and there was a positive um, effect. This was not placebo controlled. This is a retrospective study, and it is similar to a, a Japanese assessment, also retrospectively, and um, also, of course, not placebo-controlled. And it could be shown that the patients take longer time before they need um, a walking aid or a wheelchair, for example. So that is, in generally, encouraging. Now, <clears throat> we looked also at the biopsies, and we thought, what is going on? Why is the treatment not sufficiently effective? And we could see very similar to the Compath study, that the inflammatory mediators were clearly downmodulated, but not the cell stress. So although there were fewer inflammatory cells, the cell stress just kept on signaling. And the same thing happened in the cell culture system. When we exposed the cell to cytokines, they reacted with the inflammatory cell stress response. They accumulated amyloid. The inflammatory mediators were diminished, but the cell stress could not be stopped. Now, one positive thing. Regarding dysphagia, swallowing abnormalities in IBM, overall, there are three ways to tackle that. And all of these have not been studied in clinical placebo-controlled trials. All of them have been used in everyday's clinical settings. And all of these reports come from different countries, different authors, different case report series. And the first one is the balloon dilation. Personally, and in our center, we 
do not favor this technique, but still some patients have received it and many of the patients say that it has worked with them and that they would um, get it again. Um, personally, we think that we would not recommend it because we would fear some additional local damage because normally this balloon dilation is used if you have a stricture, if you have really a physical structure that compromises the esophagus or the pharynx. But this is not present in IBM. In IBM, it's a functional stenosis. And therefore, we think it might cause additional damage. But still, I'm repeating myself, it has been published and some, for some people it, it seems to work. A very efficient method is a myotomy. This means a surgical procedure under general anesthesia. It's a major surgery, which can only be done in specialized centers. And this is done in several centers in the Netherlands, for example, and in the UK. And many patients have responded to it um, very well. The point is that it is irreversible, and you may have side effects um, so this is something to think about very carefully. Now the last one is something that we do in our center and we have quite um, good experience with it and have treated a number of patients and many of them really have responded very well and have improved the swallowing function um, considerably. It is a local injection of botulinum toxin um, and you would need to swallow a tube, and this will be a very short, but still an anesthesia, and you will get injections inside this muscle that is on control, in control of the swallowing. This is another series of um, 25 patients, again with inclusion body myositis, with botulinum toxin, and here you can see pictures taken during um, the procedure. And another sample, three or four patients, um, and they improved three out of four of them. So really, um, several publications, considerably um, large series, so we think that there is um, some evidence. Yes, please, there is a question. Oh, okay. Um, with the myotomy, uh, you, I would assume, run the risk of reflux, gastroesophageal reflux? That is correct. And if you are already diagnosed with GERD, is, does that uh, eliminate you from that procedure, or is it just something that has to be controlled better? Oh, thank you for that question. So um, this is one of the major side effects that could potentially occur even if you do not have the reflux before. Um, so, this needs to be discussed with your primary physician and with the local experts who could potentially do the procedure, if or if not, that is a feasible technique for you. Personally, I would try the botulinum toxin first, and if it works, and you would like to avoid the repetitive injections and would then consider the myotomy, I think that could be a way to go as a personal suggestion. Any other questions? Please. So the question is if um, an, a tense um, electrical stimulation could be some um, other way of controlling the, f um, the, the swallowing. I know of this technique for other conditions. I'm not aware of clinical studies or case reports with this technique for IBM. It will be important to learn more of that um, and I would be open to hear about that. But so far, um, as much as I know, there are no reports on that technique for IBM. So 
What is the current agenda? These are the recent and ongoing clinical trials in IBM. I will go through all of them, and I will start with the folistatin trial. This is an open-label trial that has been completed here in the US with 15 patients. This was a local injection with an adenovirus, um, folistatin, inside the skeletal muscle, and it was shown that there was um, some improvement of the skeletal muscle, reduced fibrosis, and um, a reduced damage, reduced myopathic signs. So these are encouraging um, results, but of course it's only a um, non-controlled um, trial and it would, if someone would like to pursue this, it would require a formal placebo-controlled trial. The second study has just been published um, a month or two ago, the Bimagrumab study, the resilient trial, which unfortunately was negative. It was the largest study in IBM so far and the longest study. It went on for um, one year, and the rationale behind it was to tackle muscle growth. There is natural deficits of a gene called myostatin. Myostatin is the break on the muscle growth, and if you take away myostatin, then this is how the Belgian blue cattle happens to grow. That's a natural occurring um, cattle um, in a genetic deficit mouse, a knockout mouse. They, that's how they look like. And this is um, a young boy actually from Germany um, that has been identified with a spontaneous mutation in this very gene. So that was the background for this study, and the idea was to use a monoclonal antibody that would block this break of muscle growth and that would lead to an enhanced skeletal muscle growth. I don't know if this boy here um, really um, has trained a lot or um, had too much chicken, or if this is really a boy with um, a genetic myostatin deficit. So, first, there were cell culture studies, and they worked nicely. The muscle um, cells, they uh, um, grew much bigger. When you here look on the uh, right column, the mice also grew much bigger in a mouse model. And there was a pilot study that was placebo controlled, a very small study, but still these patients appeared to um, have um, a better performance um, for various um, study tests. Now, then there was this large study with 251 patients studied over one year, and the end result was negative. There were various readouts. The primary endpoint was the six-minute walk test that was discussed earlier today, and um, the quadriceps strength was negative. There was one piece of information that was positive, and that was in the highest dose group of the patients. There were different dosings, so different groups received um, a small, medium, or large dose of the um, antibody, and the IBM functional rating scale equivalent, the CFAR score, was um, positive in this group compared to the others, but all of the other outcome measures were, were negative. Now, presumably, these results from that study led to the stop of the Regeneron program. So another pharmaceutical company that was planning a big study in IBM as well with two different components that um, were designed to act together and to overcome muscle growth as well. But this program um, has been completely um, stopped, unfortunately. The next one is um, pioglitazone. That's a drug that is licensed for diabetes. This is an open label, phase one 
um, trial that is still active, but it's not uh, recruiting more patients. That is going on in Baltimore at the Johns Hopkins um, Institute, and it's a one-year um, study. The patients receive the oral drug. It's not without potential side effects, so it targets the PPR gamma um, pathway, which can control um, cell stress and inflammation and accumulation of amyloid. So I think this is an interesting approach. However, the drug has been found to be associated with an enhanced rate of heart failure and um, liver damage. So it is not without side effects. Now, the next study has already um, been touched upon today as well. It's the arimoclomol. It's um, um, a large um, study now with 150 patients. There has been an early phase um, two study that um, showed interesting results that I would like to share with you. The idea behind arimoclomol is not new. Um, so it has been published in 2004. Initially, it was designed as a study for ALS. And um, the rationale behind it is that it is a chaperone molecule. That means that the proteins inside the muscle fibers will be protected from cell stress. So something similar like alpha B crystalline. And <clears throat> it has been shown in a um, cell culture system that it works for muscle cells, that it can protect from um, cell stress in the muscle cells. It has been shown in an animal model in mice that it is protective and in a small concept placebo controlled trial with patients, the results were also encouraging. Um, but we will have to wait, uh, as we heard today, another one and a half years until the um, results will become available in um, 2021. Yes, please. Um, please wait for the microphone. It's almost there. Yep. Thank you. As, as these go on, um, do Can you, you get please feed um, speak to the microphone? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. A a as these go on, do you get feedback as the, as the clinical? You get it at the end, nothing in between. So there's only interim analysis if there is a harm for the patients. That means, for example, if there is an increased death rate, if there are severe side effects, then there would be an early termination. Or if the interim analysis would show that it is an abundantly positive effect and that it would be unethical to go on until the end of the study. So there will be a, a data safety monitoring board that is the standard in all international or in all bigger um, studies. They can look into the data at predefined um, time points and they can look is there a serious problem or is it really a very promising treatment and if either of the two cases would um, be true, then it could be stopped prematurely. And otherwise, yes, you're right, we would need to wait until the very end of the study. So the last study that I would um, like to um, show is the rapamycin study. And also, this was uh, mentioned today. It is a concept study that has been done at a single center in Paris by um, Dr. Ben Minist. And it has been shown, it was placebo controlled, that <clears throat> the six minute walk test in IBM patients um, improved, and that also um, the MRI parameters um, were favorably changed, and also um, the overall score of the well being, the so called HAC score, um, which the um, rheumatology field um, usually uses, um, was also beneficially changed. So this is where we are at the moment with the rapamycin. We um, are trying to pull together um, experts from um, various countries, Australia, Europe, and the US in order to um, secure sufficient funding for a big trial, um, which should go on also for one year. 
and um, currently the negotiations are going on. Hopefully, um, this trial will start soon. We do not know yet if and when. So, collectively, if we go back to the mechanism slide, where could we tackle the disease? We could um, address the inflammatory parts, and we could try to find more specific targets, for example, target um, certain cytokines or chemokines, that means mediators that play a role in the inflammation. We could, as we do with arimoclomol, look to counteract um, the cell stress mechanisms. One could potentially try to dissolve the proteins that accumulate and one could potentially in the far future maybe consider gene therapy in order to correct um, some of the predisposing factors that are present in IBM. So this brings me to the um, end of the talk and I um, thank you um, for listening and uh, we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Hi, Jens. Thanks for that great overview. Um, inflammatory molecules often keep company with one another. So you mentioned IL-1 beta there. Are IL-6 or TNF involved in this disease? And has anybody tried? I know there was a small trial with an anti-IL-1 agent, but um, there are certainly anti-IL-6 and anti-TNF agents that are out there. Do they work in this disease? Um, thank you for that question. So if um, I would... If, if you can help to convince um, funding agencies or pharmaceutical companies to do formal placebo-controlled trials, I think this would be um, attractive. Um, but so far, larger convincing placebo-controlled trials with such components are not available yet. You, you talked about the amyloid uh, inclusion bodies. What's the difference between those and P62? So P62 is a marker um, that is positive um, on, the, on the route of um, signaling these cells where they are usually degraded. So there are several... Um, steps during this cascade of either um, the proteasome machinery, the autophagic machinery, and the cells, they get tagged, for example, by ubiquitin. And at the different um, steps, you can um, use different techniques of staining and detect the proteins that accumulate. You can use neurofilament, you can use P62. Um, that is one of the uh, most sensitive markers. couple of questions. First of all, on the, uh, have you used MRI uh, on, uh, 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 with patients and, uh, and uh, that's, an, uh, you know, that's being advanced, you know, every year they come up with a better, every few years they come up with a better MRI machine. Um, and I, I want to know what you see in MRI when you're diagnosing this. And, and then also, I know on my muscle biopsy, they, they have d different slides with different dye colors uh, to, to show different things. Can you explain a little bit between the different dye colors and what, what you're looking for in, in, in uh, the analysis of those slides? So the first question regarding the MRI, um, this would be another lecture. Because not only MRI, there is very recently a whole set of ultrasound studies in IBM. 
with various concepts, for example, early diagnosis by doing an ultrasound of the finger flexors. An ultrasound is even more quicker. It could be done by the neurologist as you walk into the, uh, uh, the practice. So yes, this is important. Imaging is important. It's not within the scope um, of the talk that I was um, asked to deliver. Um, and yes, it can A, tell us which muscles are affected and the way how they are affected. Um, are they just damaged or is there a replacement by fat or fiber type tissue? So it could give us an idea of the stage and the type and the pattern of which muscles are truly affected even before they, they get weak. So yes, MRI is helpful, ultrasound is helpful. However, so far it can only tell us what I just said, the muscle is affected, yes, no. Is there fiber type tissue, is there fat tissue? But it, so far it does not help us entirely to say, is it T cells, is it B cells, is it TDP43, is it amyloid, because this is um, one step too far, so at least um, today. So regarding your second question, regarding the dyes of the immunohistochemistry, this relates um, very much to the question regarding P62, um, that we have different markers that we can use to look at cell stress cascades, the protein metabolism, the inflammation, and we can um, look, we can choose from different drawers of antibodies that we, we can put on the biopsy and stain them with different dyes, red, green, blue, as indicators of the cascades of the pathomechanisms that um, I try to convey. Thank you. Um, one of the other things that they've been talking a lot about through this whole few days is exercise. Are there any studies that combine both the pharmaceutical studies and as well as the exercise studies and what kind of results have they been? Thank you. That's another um, important area which again is at least half a lecture on its own um, to have a the pharmaceutical studies, which uh, were part of um, my assignment, but then um, physiotherapy, and then also alternative treatments like nutrition factors, like leave out certain substances, high protein diet, um, for example. Um, yes, there are several studies on physiotherapy in IBM, and yes, this is an extremely important basis for every um, patient to do appropriate physiotherapy so far. I, I'm, I'm going to that. So far, I'm not aware of any combination study in a placebo-controlled fashion with or without physiotherapy and with or without um, a drug. Normally, in all of these clinical trials that we have uh, reviewed today, in all of them, the physiotherapy was the standard, but in both groups, in the placebo arm as well as in the treatment arm. Um, you mentioned mitochondrial testing to see who would be, um, have some protective um, issues like that TOMM, I don't know. So how do you know to be tested? For, I mean, is that tested in the mitochondrial t uh, panel or? Important question. So all of these predisposing factors, these are research type factors that can be addressed in a research setting. None of these factors are commercially available as a simple genetic testing. And all of these factors are not one gene one disease type thing like a muscular dystrophy where you know I have this gene and I will at some point develop this or that disease. Um, these factors are more like um, factors that act in concert with other factors together and per se one of these factors alone will not be sufficient to cause a disease. 
Does that answer your question? Some way. Some way. So, and in terms of the mitochondria, so far, we do not have sufficient availability of standardizing these tests. For example, if your mitochondria would be vulnerable or not in terms of IBM, we can look for this polymorphism, yes, in a research setting. But this may not be the only factor. There may be other factors which, which may be even um, more aggressive or which may be more helpful. Dr. Schmidt, uh, regarding your very comprehensive and elegant presentation of uh, molecular biology of uh, inclusion body myositis, uh, what is your insight regarding the fact that prednisone is not effective in this disease? Thank you for that question. Um, and you're alluding to why is it not effective if there is so much inflammation? So this is something which we see in other diseases as well, like in rheumatoid arthritis, like in multiple sclerosis. We know if you have a rheumatoid arthritis flare or if you have um, a relapse in multiple sclerosis, if you give steroids for some time, then the steroids will help to diminish that inflammation and will help you to recover. However, for the long term, in these chronic diseases, steroids are not effective sufficiently. And we think that a similar um, a reason is true in IBM that for this severe inflammation, the muscle is a big organ, for this severe inflammation to really keep in check the inflammation, um, the steroids are just not sufficient, at least not in the dose that you could um, tolerate over, um, for example, a year or, not, or longer. Thank you. Any other questions? Please wait for the microphone. In addition to um, you know, the muscle biopsy and the CK and the, um, and the EMG, uh, is there any, you know, I, I, I'm in a clinical trial, Aramakamal, they, do a, uh, they draw blood and check the blood. It, it, are there th are markers or things in the blood besides the CK level that you look at to, that uh, uh, is common in IBM patients? Yes, well, these are part of the um, studies that um, I mentioned, for example, this FICO um, study. That was um, a large US-European uh, proteomics approach where biopsies were used to look at certain muscle fibers that showed protein accumulation or that appeared normal, and they were exci excised by laser microdissection, and then the whole proteome, um, so that means all of the proteins that exist in the body were analyzed in the different subsets of the muscle fibers and then from a series of patients. So that's a large undertaking. And yes, this has been done in a research um, setting, but um, these elements are um, not like a standardized test that you could just send out to the lab like the CN1A antibody, which is a biomarker. Um, but it is not comparable to that. So the CNL1A antibody is one of the markers, but other than that, we do not have um, a hot topic marker available for IBM yet. You had another question? So, uh, Wait a second, please. So my husband had the whole exome sequencing done, and one of the questions I had for the lab was, what were the specific gene? Like, I know that you said earlier that there isn't a, obviously a specific gene, but there were, there were specific genes that would make, you know, like the HLAs or that would make someone more predisposed for Correct. IBM. So Correct. if I talk to the lab again, what would lab or what would you think I should ask them? Like, what am I looking for? Well, the the uh, molecules that you could look for are those that were on the one slide. For example, the, the, the subtypes of the HLA molecules. 
However, these are statistics, so these are hundreds of patients. And over the collection of several hundred patients, there is some degree of likelihood that if you have that allele, then you might be more prone to develop the disease. But it doesn't mean that if you have that factor that you have to um, develop disease, that if, if, if you haven't, you cannot develop the disease. But other than those markers so far, um, I cannot um, say which other factors to look at. So if there's maybe one last question, and then probably we can Yes, one last question, and then session. maybe please just make sure you fill out the evaluations as well. Thank you. What's the difference between genetic and familial? You mean IBM? Uh, or genetic well, and familial? Oh, you mean in, in general. general? Yeah. OK, so genetic means normally, like hereditary or genetic, that means you have one gene, like muscular dystrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There is one mutation or one gene abnormality, and then you acquire the disease. The familial setting, that means that in one family, there is a higher risk, for example, to, to develop Sjogren's disease or rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis, like um, immune-prone um, family, if you would like to call it like that, without a single gene that will lead to that, like not a monogenetic trait. So then, thank you again for the lively discussion and have a good rest of the conference. Thank you.